With its extreme toughness and traction, the new BF Goodrich Mud Terrain TAKM3 is built to climb, made to mud and created to conquer. Find out more at bfgoodrich.com.au. The BF Goodrich Mud Terrain TAKM3. What are you building for? You're listening to Errol Parker and Clancy Overall, editors of the Batuta Advocate on Desert Rock FM. Good afternoon, listeners, and welcome to this week's Batuta Advocate News Hour, broadcasting live on Desert Rock FM 96.5 from the Koala Mattress Studio here in the heart of our town's old city district. My name is Errol Parker. Good afternoon. And my name's Clancy Overall. This week, we have an action-packed show. Joining us a little later on will be Brooke Boney from Triple J to discuss her meteoric rise from the coal side of the Hunter Valley to the steps of Parliament House and now on to bigger and arguably better things at the National Broadcaster. But first, to local news. For our local listeners this week, we'll probably trim this out of the podcast for our national and international listeners, but we had some sad news earlier this week after Australia Post announced their intention to close the Batuta Grove Post Office. Yes, the leafy London plain-lined boulevards, avenues and cul-de-sacs of the top end of town are going to have to get used to not having a post office uh, at their beck and call. Terrible news for the landowning class, isn't it? They've had a bad run recently. In a word, Clancy, yes. It's bad news all around for them. Uh, The closure of their postal service comes just weeks after a local pub in the area was sold at auction to a property developer who plans to turn the 100-year-old pub into a set of boutique apartments. Yes, that was sad to hear. The Cashew and Pogo Stick Hotel in Batuta Heights was sold in June to a Chinese-led consortium of investors who plan to gut the Hilltop Institution, which has been a haunt for local conservative politicians since the days of Joe. Uh, but in a simple twist of fate, Clancy, the local residents have banded together to protest the plan to repurpose the heritage-listed pub that they used to repeatedly make noise complaints to council about. Uh, a change.org petition has been set up, which has so far collected close to 300 digital signatures. Well, even the mayor got involved last week. That there must be must be a bit of a campaign behind yeah. it. Councillor Keith Carton said he plans to look the DA over and make sure no heritage will be lost during the demolition. However, he told local residents that if they want to fight the proposed development, they need to do it properly in the Land and Environment Court. Well, Clancy, just between me and you and our, and our local listeners, I do find it quite ironic that these rich borgy toffs are now trying to save the pub that they have spent many, many years trying to shut. The cashew and pogo stick, as we all know, doesn't have a smoking area, so it forces a lot of drinkers out onto the footpath where they tend to yahoo and carry on long into the night, which has been quite, to borrow a word from the left-wing media, quite problematic for a lot of these right-wing landowners around the Cashew and Pogo Stick, so I guess they're going to have to learn to deal with a little bit of irony in their lives, Clancy. You would find that funny, wouldn't you? Yes, I would find that quite funny, Clancy, because when the rich burn, I warm my hands. So you'll be donating your uh, end of financial year bonus to the Smith family? Well, as my dead shit son-in-law's surname is Smith, then yes, uh, that's technically correct. How is he finding that koala mattress you so generously bought him the other day, or a couple of weeks ago now? Well, I wouldn't know, Clancy. Uh, I try not to speak to him at all, especially regarding things like his own personal comfort. Uh, I ask him things like, why are you still living in my sunroom, you useless bag of shit? And, and I tell him things like, if you weren't engaged to my daughter, if you weren't the father of my beautiful grandson, then you'd be out on your ass quicker than a bloke having too much fun in a Sydney pub. Yeah, right. Well, um... The discount code is right there on that piece of paper there. It's uh, the, the one that's got Koala Reed on top. Oh, okay. Okay. If you're in the market for a Koala mattress, which... Uh comes in an easy to move and carry box please direct your internet browser to www.koala.com.au take a look at the range and when you're ready to make a purchase be sure to use the discount code roadkill which will get you $200 off your next order it's a great deal if you ask me that's all one word roadkill roadkill that's the word to use i did use that discount code when i bought the mattress uh, the other day And because we're inside a metro area, the mattress came the same day and the kids were sleeping on it that night. Who says capitalism is evil? It kind of, it works well for um, for people in in big areas like Batuta and Brisbane and Sydney, you know, capitalism. Who says it's evil? Certainly not this broken down old cowboy, Clancy. 
Okay, well, I think we'll pick the podcast up here. I'll uh, just put a note in the margin. Okay, that was local news. It's time to introduce this week's guest on the program. Yes, she's uh, she's already read our bulletin on uh, on Friday afternoon, and if you missed that, well, here's a little sample. Hello, I'm Brooke Boney, and you're listening to Batuta's Weekly News Bulletin. Desert Rock FM stalwart Bruce Hitchcock is on holiday this week, and I'm filling in to wrap up the biggest stories from Australia's oldest and most respected newspaper. Well, big feedback from uh, last week's interview with uh, Campbelltown rapper MC Curser. He's, he's made quite a brand, you know, outside of mainstream attention. And, uh, you know, of course, with that interview, we, we came in pretty hard on on Triple J and, and other FM radio stations. But yeah. We thought we'd give them a hug this week and um, and bring in one of their own. Also, arguably one of the biggest names in um, journalism, I guess, in oh, Australia. Stop it, boy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I dare say, Brooke, Brooke Boney, <laughs> Bones even. <laughs> Uh, is, is, is yeah, you're a household name now, and there's not many journalists that are household names anymore. I mean, there's a lot of opinionists and columnists who are household names, but mm. not many journalists. I mean, there's probably you, Kate McClymont. Yeah, it's it's a lot better than being an infamous journalist, which I guess you could call most people on Channel 7 these days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Look, I don't want to slam any of my colleagues cross network or otherwise. Yeah. Um, but I'm I'm pretty flattered that you'd put me in the same category as her. I don't know if I belong there. Well, you're yet to, you know, uncover a rugby league salary cap scandal or, you know, New South Wales uh, Labor Party corruption, but you, you definitely are out there in in the um, in the public eye because you're a news journalist mm. and and you, and you came through the gallery. We kind of want to talk to you about your career. Um, yeah, that's uh, for those playing at home. That's the press gallery in Canberra. Yeah. Yep. Bit of lingo there. Yeah, a little bit of journalistic jargon. Mm. Mm. We, we're yet to be invited down there. We've made many applications, but yeah, we got- did make one a couple of years ago, and we were uh, we were knocked back by um, Eliza Barello. She oh no! Used to be at the ABC. Hopefully, she's gone on to greener pastures now. Um, <laughs> no, I think she's still with us. Well, I reckon you'd have to hit up Spearsy. Spears. Well, yeah. he was, but I think he's gone too. Spears. Well, now's your time no, to well, strike, boys. Well, now is the time to strike because uh, Sky News is under siege and he's probably the last kind of um, advertisable uh, personality yeah. they have mm. there, monetizable anyway, because those other two curly-haired boomers, which we won't sledge yeah. cross network. And we won't sledge curly hair either. I will not hear no. a bad word about curly hair. Thank you, you You're closeted much. actually right now. With I the, am. Yeah. I'm code yeah. switching. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a betrayer of the curly-headed people. <laughs> Straighten on the reg. Now, Bones, tell us a little bit about where you you grew up. You're in a mining kind of area. Mm. Yeah. Well, when I say to people I'm from the Hunter Valley and they go, Ooh, wine, oh, wow, wine. how exotic, that's beautiful. <laughs> and then I just quickly remind them that there is uh, that whole other part, the Upper Hunter Valley past, yeah, the, the beautiful um, um, beautiful vines towards mm. the mines where there's some lovely big holes in the ground. Mm. Um, the Newcastle Knights Nursery, yeah, as I believe exactly. It's and you know, I have told Rainy. you boys that my brother um, played a few games for their juniors, pride mm. and joy of our family. Yeah, and um, that's where I grew up in Musselbrook. So um, all my family work in coal mining, yep. and it's actually mining that took us to that area because my nan and pop grew up um, on missions in yep. northern New South Wales, so in Tumala and in uh, another little place called Ashford. And when they started having fair-skinned kids, um, mm. it was around the time when they were still um, taking kids away. Yep. And so they were terrified. They were so scared. They moved off the missions and Pop started doing all sorts of different work. Um, eventually ended up doing coal mining and that took them to Musselbrook. Right. So that's, you're not when, when you kind of talk about Musselbrook as home, that's not your family's home necessarily. No. no. So my home country is up, up north. So I'm a Gamilaroi woman. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of... Uh, deadly Gamilaroi women oh, getting yeah. around at the moment. Plenty, Thelma plenty Plum, mm. Nakia Louie. Uh, yeah. There's a few of us. Um, and, and that's Gamilaroi with a G. Mm. Well, you can spell yeah. it all different sorts of ways because yeah. it's an Aboriginal word. Yeah. So it would have just been like spoken and not written yeah. down. Yeah. But yeah. there's like Gamilaroi, Camilleroy, yeah, yeah. Gomeroy. There's, of course, the highway as well, which is which is with a K. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Plenty of potholes. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I'm not going to claim that highway. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. Yeah. Now you came. You're, so your family's from out, out around that way. Mm-hmm. So they ended up in the Hunter, where you became uh, a rugby league family, I guess you could say. 
Um, Big so rugby league are they, family. Were they betrayed about their daughter becoming an ambassador for the Sydney Swans? Yeah. Well, there's been a few stern words um, and yeah. I've had to – I actually um, – to prove my loyalty to them, they made me eat 45 meat pies in one weekend. Uh, and I did it. I did it gladly, and and I'll do it again. No, that's not true. But my whole family is obsessed with rugby league. So, um, like my grandfather played, and like I think that back then as well, when he was kind of growing up and when he was a young man, it was like a good way for Aboriginal people to fit in mm. to country towns because you know once you've all played on a team together, you sort yeah. of have a certain level mm. of respect. So like uh, you know. Playing rugby league is a big source of pride. Like sometimes when I go home at the weekends back to Musselbrook, there'll be like four or five of my cousins all playing for the same team. Yeah. My auntie will be running water. Um, my uncle Gordy used to like um, like run the club. So like massive rugby league fan. And then when I moved to Sydney in 2006 and I went to my first Swans game and I thought, oh, my God, these guys aren't just running forward and backward. They're just getting smashed from every angle. And I just love the athleticism of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and great spectator sport. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great game. Difficult to play. Have you ever had a had a run? No. Uh, it, it actually, realistically, Batuta uh, should have a bigger Aussie Rules following, considering that you know our closest capital is Adelaide. Mm. But you know, rugby league is kind of um, solidified within the borders. Yeah, I yeah. think the borders, uh, especially the border with South Australia, out here in the Simpson Desert, is 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 more than just a line on a map. Mm. It's, uh, mm many cultural differences in, in between the uh, the folk over at Birdsville and down there at Inaminka. They're very uh, And it's your, your differences tribal. that define you. You know, yeah. you've got to yeah. stick to that. You and can't betray time, yourself. time zones as well, you know, half an hour behind exactly. down there. Half an hour and 20 years behind <laughs> yeah. in Adelaide. Yeah. Now, tell, tell us a little bit about how you got your start in journalism because you could have easily been wearing high-vis and being f- – you know, fly in, fly out from the Kimberley or, or something. Absolutely. You came from a mining family. You would have it's, – it's, it's quite – actually, it is quite nepotistic in a sense, that mm. kind of industry. Oh, absolutely. All my – like my brother works out in mining now, my sister's boyfriend. Um, I could have easily ended up there or, I, you know, for a lot of my cousins, you know, I could have easily ended up with – couple of kids and Mm -hmm. you know even when I go back to um you know different parts of the country and I see how some of my cousins live on missions and stuff like that could have Mm -hmm. easily been me um I don't know how I ended up in such a different place I think you know when I was growing up there was you know we were quite poor and I remember thinking um to myself like when I was going through school um I don't want to be poor anymore like Mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to live like this. Mm-hmm. And I want so to be I, in the chairman's lounge with the I SCG. want to be in the chairman's lounge. You know what? I want to be picked up by a five series. I want to be like <laughs> swilling champagne. Thank you very much. That's the life I see for myself. <laughs> Big money bones. Yeah, yeah, good. So good. Good. <laughs> aspirational. So uh, in order to get all those things, um, um, why did you choose journalism of – of all the things that you could well, be getting into if that- you wanted to uh, <laughs> if you wanted to tap yourself into a river of gold you know there is a yeah. whole smorgasbord of things like economics mm. law or finances yeah. or Forego a job as a merchant banker to go and, and yeah. work as a journalist for the public broadcaster. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, probably a poor choice in yeah. hindsight. Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm, I'm maybe not on the right path. No, but I, when I was younger, um, when I was growing up, there was no one who like looked like me or sounded like me mm-hmm. or told our stories in a way that I could mm-hmm. sort of relate to. And I think whether or not you sort of realise it um, – it kind of defines who we are as a country, you know. Yeah. When you look at the TV and there's a lot of white faces on there and they all have similar names and speak the same or whatever, um, you look at it and you think, oh, well, I'm a young black girl who lives in the country. Um, I'm not I, Hamish McDonald. I'm not Hamish <laughs> McDonald, but I won't hear a bad word about him either. He's a lovely bloke. Yeah. Um, very blonde. <laughs> yeah. And but, the eyes, very blue. And he has like those, uh, like, 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 like that international school accent that's very, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the Nicole Kidman accent. The one you can only get from working at Al Jazeera for five years. <laughs> That's a very I'm good I'm going to be broadcast across the English-speaking world. So yeah. you um, yeah, you thought, you know, I can throw my hat in the ring here. Well, I want to give this a go because, you know, it's not fair that, you know, people watching, and it doesn't matter if they're black or not or, you know, it could just be from the country or mm. it could be from anywhere else, like if you're from a working-class family or whatever. Um, when you look at it and you, you see yourself, not reflected in that then you feel like you're not a part of it and also like there were just so many things that were happening around me and I thought I want to be the person who tells these stories like Mm -hmm. I want to be the person who can help get these messages out there like I'm sick of our stories being told by people who aren't a part of our community Mm -hmm. because 
it, it means that they don't get told in the same way. It might not be as fair. And I think it takes a certain level of trust um, for black people to be able to trust journos and, mm-hmm. you know, get their stories out there. So um, I wanted to be one of the people who could tell those stories. Mm. Tell us about the path, the immediate steps you took, because we were your housing commission up there in Musselbrook? Yeah. So for, from a little house kid up there in the upper hunter, the mine, not <laughs> the wine upper, hunter. upper yeah. hunter, yeah. 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 Mine, not wine. Um, where, where was your first play? Was it was it school? Well, actually, I did work experience at Power FM yeah. in Musselbrook. Yeah. And... Um, I when I was in year ten, I did work experience at Power FM, and they gave me this um, segment called the Rock Chick. Right. And so I'd go in um, like one day after school and use their internet and do all this research about how um, Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake had broken up, or Christina oh, right. Aguilera was like about to release this song called Dirty that was going to blow everyone's minds. And I'd just record, <laughs> pre-record like a whole bunch of them for them to play in yeah. the top twenty at, yeah. at night time. Yeah. That was your first move. That was my first move. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and then I went and I studied at UTS. Okay. And um, like I had some help from the Jumbunner unit there because I actually didn't fin- finish high school. Right. And um, so they have like an alternative entry sort of pathway um, to get into journalism because it's big marks yeah. to get into that journalism course. And I guess yeah, just right. like what you were saying before, you kind of plead your case and go through a different avenue, which is probably... I'm going to provide a different voice in journalism. Is that kind of how you you went through it? Is that kind of how yeah. you... Yeah. yeah. Well, you have to sit some exams and write yeah. some essays and stuff. And, like, I was quite, you know, I was quite bright. It's not like yeah. I was a, you know, dumb dumb asking to get into, like, you mm. know, some sort of economics and law thing that I wouldn't mm. be able to grasp. Like, they were like, yeah, you'll be all right. Yeah, Chuck yeah. her in there. It wasn't legally blonde. It wasn't legally blonde, although, um, you know, banned and snap. Maybe I should have had some sort of, like, uh, motto or catchphrase or something. That would have got me into law. <laughs> in Sydney, definitely. Uh, <laughs> now, you you were in there. You were UTS. AIM? AIM came into it somewhere in the mix? Yeah. yeah. So I did some mentoring and stuff with AIM. Yep. And they were some of the best years mm-hmm. at, um, well, at uni because... You, you, when you're away from your family or you're away from your community, sometimes you sort of disconnect from your purpose and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, I'm living this like flash life down here and, yep. you know, life's pretty easy. And then you remember when, you know, you see these kids who are, you know, their parents don't care about them or then maybe they're living in like a foster home or, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, they're like got a pretty tough life. And you're like, oh, yes, there's a reason I'm yep. doing it. There's yeah, a reason yeah. I'm working so hard. So these yep. kids can have a, a life that's a little bit easier. And that, I guess... Um came to be uh, a a long-standing relationship all the way up to the Hottest 100, which is now working alongside alongside AIM, isn't it? Yeah, so they um, were like in partnership with Triple J for the Hottest 100 for a few years. And I think um, like in the last, uh, at the last Hottest 100, they raised like 250 grand for them, Mm, which is epic. Like that was the, one of the amazing things about um, like all of the generosity on that day. You see that people actually really do give a shit Mm. about... um, about the causes behind it. Yeah. Mm. Now, tell us what was your next play? You've got the degree. You're doing yep. you're doing Koori Radio. Well, actually, you know, I was a um, political correspondent for NITV while I was still studying. Right. So I started in Canberra um, in the press gallery for NITV the week that Ruddy rolled Gillard. Yeah, right. It was my right. first week there. I think it was like the Jeez. Wednesday night or something from memory. How old were you? Um, how many? When was that? 2013? So it was five yeah. years ago. So I would have been 25. So that's when Rudd came back to yep. lose the election to Tony. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. So he rolled yeah, Gillard and then I think there was maybe another couple of sitting weeks or maybe one more sitting week, pulled in old mate from PNG, did that yeah. offshore immigration yep. deal and then called the election the next week and yep. then... I actually, you Got know, steamrolled. absolutely steamrolled. And it was, it was the craziest experience because obviously like, uh, you know, between us, no one's going to hear this, right? Mm. Um, yeah. I was shitting myself because I was like, mm. oh my God, I'm in over my head. I thought I'd have like, you know, a few months to settle in and then yeah, the yeah. election would be like sort of later and I'd sort of find yeah. my feet That was kind bit. of a Super Bowl week. Wasn't oh my it? God. I was yeah. thrown in the deep end massively having to do live crosses and, you know, there's something to be said for experience and, and, you know, all of that background knowledge when it comes to doing those live crosses because you draw on it big time. 
And um, the day that he called the election, I was out kicking the footy around in the park with my boyfriend at the time. And I actually, I broke my finger. Can you see how it's bent? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. I can bend it like that. And so he kicked Heavy. it and it sort of hit on the top and broke it. But then he called the election. So then I had to get all my <laughs> bags ready. And I was on the election trial for with like four weeks with, with a broke- broken finger. Was it? Did you have time to no, bandage it? No. <laughs> Straight on the bus. I was out of there and I was like, look, I'm pretty sure it's broken. I'm pretty sure it's broken. And yeah. then for the rest of the four weeks, I was sort of torn between doing love crosses and looking down at my poor hand, which looked like it was just completely mangled by this Ouch. torp. So how did you find it though? Like I can remember the first election trail I was on um, uh, when Howard rolled uh, Keating. <laughs> Uh, all those years ago. <laughs> yeah. um, Seems like yesterday. Yeah, uh, you know, I did find it quite hard to keep up at times, you know. There wasn't necessarily too many people helping me, um, you know, because I was the new kid on the block. Mm. Were there many people helping you? Like, were there any other sort of journalists or, or pollies that you could turn to for a little bit of advice? Yeah, you'd be surprised. Like, a lot of the pollies, um, they're quite generous with their time. Like, I, I think... You don't really see it come across in press conferences a lot. But I remember there was this one time when we were in Melbourne, um, I think we were in the seat of Higgins, and they were announced, um, the coalition was announcing their, um, their policy for um, maternity leave. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't quite get it. And Hockey was there and he was like part of the announcement or whatever. And he came over to me after because he saw the question that I asked and he explained it. Mm. <laughs> and so like, they, they're quite generous yeah, like yeah. that if, if they've got time and yeah, you know, yeah. if they're a decent decent person and like most of them are kind of fine or whatever but also like your um, colleagues in the press gallery they were so generous Um, people like Mickey Gordon who's passed away now um, he had so much knowledge about Mm. Indigenous affairs and he was one of those blokes who um, like a lot of the time people get put on that round it's Mm -hmm. sort of a junior round and you kind of use that as a stepping stone to go somewhere else but he actually genuinely and very deeply cared about the yeah. issues. And so he'd always be like, oh, what do you think of this? Or like, you know, if you put this in the context of that, then, you yeah. know, this is a weird decision or why are they announcing this policy? You know, why is Forrest doing this review instead yeah. of a labour market economist or, you know, whatever. Um, so there were so many people that you could lean on. Twiggy Forrest there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, the quarantine <laughs> cards, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wasn't he... Just well, the remember, perfect person to decide out. Well, remember that he did that whole review that Abbott announced um, in, during the 2013 yeah, yeah. election. Yeah, we do remember the uh, the basic card system. Yeah. Now, um, tell us about that. When, you, when you're looking at different issues like that and and, uh, and and different types of politicians, you're a country kid, you're a Koori girl. What kind of relationship do you have with, with politicians? I mean, obviously there's a lot of country... Uh, people in in uh, down in Canberra, a lot of people from the bush. Uh, not many of them are black. Uh, there's a few, uh, but then you've also got you know the Greens, who are the uh, white knights of um, Aboriginal Australia, who kind of um, uh, are, are coming from another angle, which is mm. probably not bush. You know, it's very inner city. Yeah. Uh, how how do how do you how do you gauge the uh, the politicians down there? Well, Just- do you know what's really funny? It's like. You know, everyone's always really happy when they see an Aboriginal person mm. um, who is doing well. Mm. You know, like, I think that there's always, like, a lot of goodwill towards me, and I'm so grateful for that. But um, every time you meet someone, it doesn't matter sort of what political leaning they have, mm. they always take credit for it. Yeah. So, like, it could be, um, you know, say if it was a Greens person, and I'm just saying hypotheticals here, but this <laughs> is the sort of comments that you get, you know, yeah. oh, it must be because you're so strong in your culture, or, you know, like, you've got a really <laughs> strong family background, or, you know, because of this or whatever. And then you speak to a lib and they're like, um, oh, you know, it must be because of your um, individual pursuits and your your individual hard work. You know, like they all your use innovation. their own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they all use their own. They all take credit for your um, success mm. um, using their own ideology. Yeah. They, they, they just connect their own dots. So that's one thing that I found about being down there. Yeah. It's like n- no one is like good or bad or whatever i mean there are and that's a broad <laughs> there's a few stroke. villains yeah yeah yeah. but you know like everyone believes that they're doing the right thing because yeah. they actually subscribe to their own ideology mm-hmm. and so none of them look at um you know the, the policies that they're designing they're like, you know what i'm going to be a dickhead today i'm going to mm-hmm. do this or you know what i'm going to i'm going to whatever they all actually believe that they're doing the right thing and that's yeah. one thing that I learned and found really strange about being down there is that mm. there are like all of these separate realities happening at the same time. Yeah. 
Did you ever get the feeling, and I know a lot of uh, politicians and uh, Errol uh, mentioned it, uh, has mentioned it many times, down there in Canberra, it, it just gets to the point, maybe it's the middle of winter, everyone's pissed all the time. Do you ever, <laughs> do you ever get that feeling like maybe we've let lunatics, lunatics run the asylum, essentially? Like, do you ever wonder what the, this is where the decisions are being made in mm. this cesspool of like, you know, uh, Kind of broken families and overprivileged, um, overprivileged uh, old red nosed drunks. Well, then there's a there's a couple of times <laughs> where you like think these people are running the bloody country. Yeah, you yeah. know, like you'd look around at public bar on a Wednesday night um, during the sitting week. You'd be like, these are the people who were responsible for making all of these decisions about yeah. our lives. Yeah. Um, and you sort of pinch yourself a little bit, but then at the end of the day, like they're human as well, and I don't yeah. want to shit can anyone because. Like, it is a pretty tough job. Like, they're away from their families a lot of the time. They give up a hell of a lot. A lot of them are really smart and could probably make a lot more money doing other stuff, Mm -hmm. um, like working in private enterprise or businesses or banks or whatever. But they choose that career as a politician for whatever reason, Um, probably because they genuinely do believe that they're going to make a difference or because they'd like to see the country run in a way that they subscribe to. Or they just like the power. (laughs) <laughs> or they, or they just power hungry. There guys. was abs- yeah. there's absolutely no reason for Malcolm Turnbull to be doing what he's doing, <laughs> other than, other than the fact he hops up in the morning and he's just like, I've got so much fucking power. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm not going to say anything about this. Malcolm Turnbull's motivations. You know, we don't have to. This is. <laughs> Yeah, no, we we we, we can um, yeah, say what we want about the uh, the powers that be. But obviously, you're in a position now. I'm, I'm impartial. I'm a journalist. You've got to be, especially ABC. Yeah. Have been in a little bit of trouble, so Boney's not going to say anything about anyone. No, 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 um, no. But uh, one thing we do want to ask is uh, this stuff about Sarah Hanson Young, mm. um, Lionhelm. This this conversation that's, that's arisen in the last week, which you know, arisen. Uh, around the country and in the households of Australia this week about uh, actually Parliament House might not be a good place for women. Like it might be, there might be a bit of a culture there that that, that, that results in these kind of incidences that happened to Sarah Hanson Young. Um, what what are your thoughts as a particularly a young woman down there? Um, did you did you see a bit of that? Did you see a bit of the the grubbery? I look. I think it's. It's like any workplace where there are a lot of men mm. and fewer women. Mm-hmm. It's It can be a really, really difficult place um, for women. And we've seen that from both sides. Like we mm. saw how Peter Credlin was treated. Yep. We saw um, some of the comments made about people from Shorten's office. Mm-hmm. We've seen, um, you know, how Sarah Hansen Young has been treated. Or, mm-hmm. or Parliament or whatever. There are some things that you, um, that you just, uh, a certain level of respect probably should be given. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it is a difficult place for women. Yeah. Um, I think that you kind of do have to be a little bit tougher, but, you know, that's that's what happens when you have a workplace where there's a lot of men. Mm-hmm. It is made a lot harder, though, I reckon, by people like Mr. Lionhill, um, because, you know, how all of us know that he was that he came to power on a fluke because, <laughs> because he was number one on the New South Wales uh, upper house card and he had the word liberal in his party name, so he swept to power mm. under a bit of a fluke. And I think now he's just trying to get his name out there in this upcoming election. What would you put in your name if you wanted to sneak in? <laughs> I would put in the Socialist Shooters Farming Liberal <laughs> Alliance of National Australia. I think I've just thought of it. What is the it? The Liberal Workers' Party. That's good. That's mm. covering off a lot of bases. Yeah, you kind of. You're probably missing cast, the Greens yeah. vote, though. What would you do there? The Liberal Workers. Albo Party. No. Well, the Liberal no. Workers Party could be the made shooters up and of. Recyclers. Um, <laughs> the shooters and recyclers. <laughs> yeah. So then, does that mean that all of the cases for the um, bullets in your shotgun are made out of not. Re- they're recycled. Yeah, they're made out no of. No single use plastic yeah. here. Thank you very much. Yeah, the hemp for the 12 gauge. Yeah, exactly. Well, you can. Sort of reload uh, twelve gauge cartridges. You just repack them and yeah. then double yeah. down. She's revealing a bit too much about herself. Getting up there and <laughs> shooting road signs up there in Muscle Walk as a teenager. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> do you see? Do you see a bit of that? Um, do you see the bit of that come out of you now? Especially you know working in the um, the Kremlin of um, Ultimo down there. <laughs> Uh, do you ever see a little bit of that? You know, because you, 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 you're working with lovely people, I guess, and a lot of open-minded and 
you know, um, three generations, Piermont, Balmain types. Do you ever just see a little bit of that townie come out of you and you kind of shock them a bit? Um, I think probably a lot of the things I say shock a lot of the people that I see. I mean, I, you know, um, I'm, I'm a sweet and innocent young woman and then sometimes when I open my mouth, things come out that I just don't mean yeah. to say. Yeah, I think I remember. That yeah. I just don't I mean to say. I remember the first time I met you too. It was... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I've um, heard the same words uh, come out of Tom Tilly's mouth too because he uh, <laughs> he has to appear outwardly as as you know a charismatic man with good hair who can play the bass guitar, but deep down there is that mongrel who likes to he's ride. A, he's a mudgy mongrel. Yeah. That's yeah. where he's from, isn't it? Mudgy. Yeah, loves yeah. his motorbikes. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes I realise that I am far more country mm-hmm. than other people. Um, yeah. yeah. What kind of music do you listen to? Like on a bass level, I know you're going to say anything that's being played on Triple J right now, but do you, were you kind of raised in one of those slim, dusty households? No, it's like my grandparents love country music, like yeah. Charlie Pride and all that mm. sort of stuff. Um, Tex Perkins. <laughs> 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 um, but I love like the Beatles and yeah. Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan. And um, I do love a lot of the stuff that Triple J plays, mm. though. I really, really love it. Um, there's a couple of really amazing, like, young Aboriginal artists coming through. Have you heard of Baker Boy? Yeah. He's yeah. so good, yeah, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, and I yeah. love his messages are so positive. Mm. He's so wholesome. I went and saw him. Um, he did a gig recently in Sydney. And he just had such a positive vibe. And I think especially when you look at other rappers and they're talking about how rich they are. Mm. And he's like, I don't need your money, whatever. Mm. Yeah, and he's yeah. just talking about, like, you know, living a healthy lifestyle, loving your family. He's just such a wholesome boy. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah. It's, you don't have to be that aspirational, do you? You don't have to be talking about, you know, court side of the net. You could be talking about, you know, healthy diet. Come yeah. on, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Be more creative in your lyrics, Jay-Z. Jeez. And you don't always have to swear. Yeah. That's, the, that's yeah. the real lesson here. We should all swear less because... As we know, you might rattle someone that you work with at the ABC, exactly. or you might up getting played on the ABC. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might. Not. Sorry, cursor. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> cursor. <laughs> you know, my little nephew calls him Kurthith. 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 Little because he can't say it. Yeah. So yeah, so that's the new generation of Musclebrook. They're, they're tuning into a bit of a bit mm. of gutter rap, bit of rough and tumble gutter rap. Yeah, yeah right. Kurthith. Well, we might have to get him. We might have to send him a line, tell him that the. Might be worth doing a underage show up in Musclebrook. Two triple three. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For, for the bones. <laughs> now, tell us what else have you kind of looking into the future? What's Backroads all about? You've been doing a bit of ABC. You've been casting the net in the ABC. It's not just mm. It's not just the ungodly 3 a.m. news breaks. It's- well, this is the thing. As a journalist yeah. now, you've got to be able to do a little bit of everything. Mm. And so when the lovely folk over at Backroads um, asked me to um, do an episode, because they, um, I, I think they pretty much doubled their season because mm. it's such a great show. Um, Sorry, check out. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> I, uh, oh, sorry, Errol's pulling faces over here. That's yeah, why no Bonnie's laughing. Is, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, um, Heather couldn't do them all, so they asked a few of us to um, step in. And they asked me to do one, and they said, you know, well, we're thinking about going up to the Tiwi Islands. Yeah. What do you know about Indigenous culture? And I said, look, quite a lot, a little yeah. bit. And they said, what do you know about footy? Yeah. And I was like, well... Let me tell you. Ambassador, right here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this tattoo isn't painted on. Have you got a swan's tattoo? No, I don't. But <laughs> your face then. <laughs> oh, that, I was just going to be disappointed, yeah. really. I was like, that is oh. what we call a very, very quick love affair. From When did you become ambassador? Well, it's been, what, I've been a Swannies fan for 12 years. Okay. No, that's that's probably tattoo worthy. Longer than any other still. relationship but that's still had, very. So that's yeah. yeah, I guess, but that's still very feral to get a sporting... Uh, you know, Look, I'm not going to rule anything that's, in or out. Okay, very, I'm not here to play the rule in or rule very out game. Classist of you, Clancy. Yeah, because to get an AFL tattoo, I have an Eels tattoo. Yeah, I know that's different though. You know, you're 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 an Eels fan, but a Swans. I don't think anyone's got a Swans tattoo. Like, you know, you're, they're more likely to get the kind of um, a passage from uh, what's that book. The Bible? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> the, the Atlas shrugged. Atlas shrugged. That's a Swans fan tattoo. The first well, Atlas yeah, shrugged. that's the uh, that's the uh, Swans fan Bible. <laughs> Atlas shrugged. You know, you go. This is slander. This is slander, and you're both you go, getting sued for defamation. <laughs> Lawyer up, boys. You go straight from Martin Place in an, U- an Uber black with your puffer vest on. <laughs> and out. 
Leave out the you go. out of this. They're actually the very practical, okay? Your body stays warm. Your arms can flail about. And your arms get cold. Kathmandu. Yeah. do. <laughs> Kathman do, Kathman don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm guessing you didn't need to wear any, um, yeah, puffer vest up there in the Tiwi Islands when you went up there. No, what was I it? didn't. What was that like? It was the terrain so back hot. to uh, your yeah your back footy to up the there. original yeah, story. Yeah, 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 so they were having. You, have you heard of the Tiwi Bombers? Yeah, yeah, and they're, 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 so there's a couple teams up there. Is there's there? A, yeah, there's a few teams up there. So yeah. they're all different. Um, like it depends on the region mm. and like where you're born and who you play for and who you t- you know your family yeah. kind of your bloodline comes through. And so they were having this massive footy carnival at the mm. same time that they had this like arts fair. And so we went up and spoke to a few people, and it's just incredible. Like it's the most beautiful place. It was only colonized about like 110 years ago right. or something. And it became like a, a Catholic mission. And the guy who went over um, to to start the mission was obsessed um, with like footy. And mm-hmm. so the, the community itself, they're so unbelievably talented. Mm-hmm. Like I saw these little kids who would have been um, probably just like up to my knee. Yeah. Like they were tiny. It was pouring with rain. Um, you know, these sort of tropical places where you imagine it's dry all day and then there's just like a downpour where like 45 tonnes of rain comes down. It's like that. And they were bouncing the ball in that. And not only that, apparently they can bounce a Coke bottle, like a two-litre Coke bottle when they don't have a footy. Right. And what? Like, uh, there were two kids who were injured. I saw this little boy, he like dislocated his shoulder. That Like they're so committed to their yeah. footy. They love it. They're obsessed with it. Like the Rioli brothers are up from there. Right. They're all Tiwi. Yeah, they're all Tiwi. And, okay. Um, what, what, how does the arts fair, does it get a bit overshadowed by this? Well, no, because they're, like, they're really famous for their art as well. Right, so they right. do like this screen printing. Mm. Um, and one of the incredible things about being up there is um, – there's a community of like transgender and gay yeah. guys. The sister girls. Sister girls. Yeah, yeah. And they're so amazing. And there's heaps of them. Mm. So it's probably like 10% of the population or something. Right. And there's this really beautiful scene um, where we were shooting, sitting in the river, and they assured me there were no crocs, and I trusted them. We're sitting there in the river, and um, we're talking about, like, you know, we're kind of playing in the water. There's a fire behind us from after me just eating this, like, big old slug that we pulled out of the woods. And I asked them, like, how is it possible that there are so many of you guys, um, so many of you girls here? And they were like, we don't know, it must be something in the water. And they just, they've found this community there and they're accepted by their peers and they feel really at home and they're allowed to do women's business. Um, They're not forced to do men's business. They're not called by their men's name. Like they're really accepted as part of the community. And they said that, you know, it's almost they're more accepted there than what they are on the mainland. Right. Which is really interesting because you kind of think of, you know, bigger cities being more accepting or whatever, but they're not. They've found like their home and that's, that's where they belong. You know, the community accepts them as as who they are. Now, tell us a little bit more about Tiwi because obviously if I was going to ask anyone about Tiwi Islands, it'd be the person who just went up there and filmed a documentary. How did they um, fare during World War Two. Did they get any Japanese action? So the first any Japanese action. they did. So yeah. they were like, there's a. Um, <laughs> they were the first ones to see the planes flying over towards Darwin to do the bombing. Right. And so there's this like little radio shack, and um, they called Darwin, and they were like, hey. We just saw these planes flying over. Like, you guys better watch out. And they were like, nah. They thought they were joking. Right. Uh, of course they weren't, and they found that out the hard way. Yeah. But one of the planes crashed, and there's this guy, Matthias, and he um, he, <laughs> he watched a lot of Western movies. <laughs> and so he walked over to this guy, this Japanese guy, who after the plane had crashed, and he was apparently like a really brave guy, and he sort of embodied the Tiwi spirit. So everyone else fled and hid, and he walked over to this Japanese guy, and he had his um like a sort of like an axe yeah. um, with a little handle and a and a um and the, the axe head, and he walks over to him and he goes, "Stick him up," <laughs> like what you saw on the movies, and then they he put the thing in the guy's back All like right. to make it feel like he had a gun. All right, and then they captured him and and brought him back across. Right, so he's like a hero on the Tiwis, yeah, because of his incredible bravery and like you know just quick response and yeah, yeah. stick him up, John Wayne, stick him up. <laughs> 
Um, but it's all in the episode. Hopefully, yeah. I haven't given it all away. Yeah, no, no. That's oh, so that that's in there too. That's in there. Oh, great! Sounds yeah. like a great yarn. Um, also, I found the world's biggest Swans fan up there. All oh, right, this little sweet old lady called Sister Anne. And so she was sent up there when she was like 22 or 23, like really, really young from um, – oh, what's that town that's like south of Canberra on the way to Melbourne? Um, Kooma? No, it's on the highway. At Gundagai? Gundagai. Yeah. She's yeah. from Gundagai. And um, so her parents sent her up there. Well, mm. not, they didn't send her up there, but like could you imagine saying goodbye to your 23-year-old daughter and she's like, yeah, I'm just going to this island in the middle of nowhere that you've never heard of with no electricity, <laughs> basically going to be living on a humpy on the was beach. Was that Catholic yeah, missionary she's, stuff? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so she went up there and she's been up there ever since, bar like a few different missions in other places, but she spent a whole life up there. And I went past her house and there's like this massive swan's banner <laughs> out the front, <laughs> all inside is like red and white. Yeah. And she goes to me, um, my favourite player of all time, is Mickey O. Love him. He is my hero. And I was like, oh, yeah, like he's amazing, of course. Like, And he's a mate of mine. So then on her birthday, I think it was like a 92nd birthday or something like that, um, I got her number and I got him to give her a call. All right. And um, apparently she was so shocked, poor old thing, like probably nearly gave her a heart attack, um, that she didn't believe it was him. And she was like, no, no, no. And so then he spent like the first 10 minutes of the phone call trying to convince her that it was actually him. Yeah, very sweet. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, that's going to continue happening, back rides? Fingers crossed, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. If everyone watches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us about the, the, the how are you handling breakfasts? Like that, that is an oh, early start. Well, it's a very early start. Yeah. So I get up at like four o'clock in the morning. We're there at five, and then I'm on air at six. So it's it's pretty tough. Mm. It just means I have to go to bed early. Yeah. I have to go to bed at like eight or eight thirty. Um. So when you start seeing like nine thirty on the clock, you're like, oh, jeez, it's going to yeah. be a long day tomorrow. Yeah. Um. But you just kind of do it. I don't. I don't. I'm not naturally like an early morning person, and I think that those people who do it for like twenty years or whatever, they're either getting paid like heaps of coin to mm. make it worth it, or they're just early morning freaks. Yeah. Um, yeah, but like you know, you get off air pretty early, and yeah. then um, you know, work on other bits of news and bits and pieces. So, well, you are working hard, Bones, um, and it's great to have you on here today. And hopefully, this is um, kind of a bit, I guess an olive branch that we've extended to the uh, public broadcaster who we have sparred with over the years, uh, um, Richard Kingsmill. Um, yeah, I, I imagine the. The, the last time we uh, we were on the ABC was just in the lead up to Origin because yeah. they couldn't find anyone in the building uh, who knew anything about Origin. Yeah, I, I had guess. to go home early that day, so I think they called you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Going to no. get Bones to come in there with one of your uncles on the line to talk <laughs> yeah, to yeah. live cross from us. Let's call Gordon Boney. Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to have you here, It's um, and it's great to chat to a, a fellow townie uh, like yourself. Um, and and all the best with your endeavours for the infinity pool and, and and the champagne with strawberries in it. I think I think uh, yeah, uh, there's plenty more to come from Brooke yeah. Boney. Well, cheers to that. Thanks, boys, for no having worries. me. Thanks, Brooke. And that was Brooke Boney, everyone. Coming up to the top of the hour, Murray's giving us a hurry on. Up next is the news with Brooke Boney, followed quickly by Hello Sport. Yeah, it's always uh, interesting to meet and. And talk to a to an ABC employee with some sort of perspective of the outside world, isn't it, Errol? Yes, it is. Uh, good to meet someone who's been a little bit further west than uh, Sydney's Harris Street or South Bank or Docklands in in Melbourne down there. Uh, you know, it's always good to mm. t- to meet a real salt of the earth ABC employee. There mm. are few and far between. Coal of the earth. Good hunter girl. Thanks for joining us, Brooke. Uh, I'm Clancy Overall. Be nice to each other. And until next week, my name is Errol Parker. Stay out out of the pokies and never talk to the police without a lawyer. With its extreme toughness and traction, the new BF Goodrich Mud Terrain TAKM3 is built to climb, made to mud and created to conquer. Find out more at bfgoodrich.com.au. The BF Goodrich Mud Terrain TAKM3. What are you building for?